The rejection of the Messiah was the last act of infamy and blasphemy that God would tolerate from the nation of Israel. Jesus told them that. When they crucified him, all the sins of the past in the entire history of the world would be visited upon them in God's wrath and judgment. God had impoverished other nations, destroyed other nations, subjected other nations for the sake of his people. But the abuse, the rejection, the mistreatment of his only beloved son was more than God would stand for. His patience had run out with these vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, as we learn in Romans 9.22. Now he would take vengeance upon them. There are many places where this is spelled out in the Old Testament, besides here in Daniel 9.27. One such place is where it all started for the nation at Sinai in Deuteronomy 28. In the first 15 verses of that chapter, God promises many wonderful blessings if they will do all that the law requires, absolutely all without fail, but it had to be pure and holy. The holy God will not accept anything but holiness. From verse 15 to verse 68, there are 53 verses of the most incredible and frightening curses imaginable. Virtually no terrible or frightening thing is left out of those verses. Now, well, it's too long to read here, but you can go there and read it if you want to know what was promised to come on these people once their house was left desolate. In verse 63 of Deuteronomy 28, God says these ominous words that bear on what Jesus told the Jews that day. He said, And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught, and ye shall be plucked off the land whither thou goest to possess it. God will take pleasure in destroying them when it is finally determined that they are not going to keep his law. That determination will not be made by them, but by him. The rejection of their king and his kingdom and the crucifixion of the Lord of glory is the abomination that triggers this desolation of Israel. When we come to the cursing of the fig tree, we'll go more fully into that. But here, Daniel tells them that the judgment brought on them for cutting off the Messiah will abide on them until the consummation of the ages, which is, of course, the end of the world. That is what Daniel 9.27 says. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even unto the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. When will this happen? It will happen in the middle of the 70th week, three and a half years into Christ's earthly ministry as king of the Jews. But did it happen three and a half years after his baptism? If he was baptized on the Day of Atonement, on the 10th day of the seventh month, and Passover, when he was crucified, was on the 14th day of the first month, is that not three and a half years plus four days? Well, that analysis overlooks something pretty significant. I'll read it to you first, and then I will explain it. Now, this is from Exodus 12, verses 3 through 6, regarding the Passover lamb, which was a type of Christ, the Lamb of God, and predicting his being slain for our sins. Speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for a lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, 
a male of the first year, ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. God's Passover lamb was to be taken on the tenth day of the month. That's exactly three and a half years after atonement. The faithful and devout among the Israelites knew this. Long before the prophet Zechariah had written in chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace unto the heathen and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, from the river even to the ends of the earth. These faithful people along the road knew that Jesus their king would ride down the hill from the city of Dates into Jerusalem and be taken on the tenth day of the first month, four days before Passover. They knew that the king would be rejected by the nation, the elders. He would be killed as their Passover lamb, and he would cut off Israel as his kingdom people, and that his kingdom would go worldwide to all people of the earth. They knew all of this because Daniel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Zechariah and others had predicted it. Specifically, in this case, they knew that the king would come into Jerusalem to be taken four days before Passover, just as the writings of Moses had prophetically foretold. Four days after that, all the assembly of Israel would kill the Passover. They also knew that they, the children of the covenant of promise, because of their faith in the Messiah, would not be cut off. They were all out there waiting for him because they knew he would be coming. The Jews who had rejected him complained to Jesus about the uproar these people were making. Jesus replied that somebody had to be there to recognize the king and his entry into Jerusalem. If those people were to hold their peace, the stones would cry out in recognition of him and in protest against what the Jews were doing to their king. This was exactly to the day, three and a half years after his baptism, which tells us plainly what the other things we looked at only indicated subjectively, his baptism was on the Day of Atonement. And since it was on his 30th birthday, this means that Jesus, the man, was born on the Day of Atonement. But what about causing the sacrifice and the oblation to cease in the middle of the week? Well, that is quite a simple matter. The sacrifice was a type of Christ and the oblation was a prayer to God to send the Messiah. Christ caused all sacrifices and offerings to cease insofar as having any legitimacy is concerned when he offered up himself. This is New Testament Doctrine 101. Hebrews 10, 11 through 18 tells us that every high priest standeth daily ministering and offering sometimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost is also a witness to us. For after that he said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where the remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Verse 26 of chapter 10 also tells us 
that there is no more sacrifice for sin. Beyond that, when Christ took the kingdom from them, he took away the authority for the sacrifice given by God to Moses. Many nations over hundreds of years had tried to destroy Jewish worship, but only God who gave it could take it away. And this is, of course, what he did, as the scriptures we just read indicate. This is not a difficult issue, and I will not belabor it. Of all the dumb, astounding things that premillennialism has come up with, the notion that animal sacrifices will be reinstated by Christ in the imaginary thousand-year kingdom after Christ returns is just about the dumbest. It goes beyond sacrilege. It's blasphemy. Of one thing you may rest assured, and you are commanded to believe, if you believe the gospel, by his death, Christ caused all sacrifices on an earthly altar to cease forever. We offer our lives and our bodies in living sacrifices to God on the heavenly golden altar of incense, but that is an entirely different matter which we cannot go into at this time. It has nothing to do with the sacrifice and the oblation of which Daniel speaks. It's obvious why he caused the oblation to cease. The Messiah had come, and they did not recognize him, and they rejected and killed him. Their only hope of the Messiah and their only chance to receive him had come and gone. They were no longer the people of God, and the Messiah would never again come to them. Men can go on making all the prayers they want, but the authorization by God for this prayer of hope and deliverance was forever taken away. All right, so let's review this passage very briefly. And I want you to listen carefully if you're interested in learning. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. The Messiah was coming to do these things, unless you think the Antichrist can make an offering for sins, finish the scriptures, put an end to visions and prophecies of a messianic nature, anoint the Most Holy, and bring in everlasting righteousness. If you do not agree that this is talking about the Christ, then you are either a pagan or you're simply not being honest. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. It would be at the end of the 483rd year after the commandment was given to begin the restoration of Jerusalem to the coming of the Messiah. This commandment, we showed, likely authorizes work to begin on the Day of Atonement. The Messiah Prince did start his ministry to Israel on the first day of the 484th year. It was three and a half years before the tenth day of the first month, the people along the road, commended by Jesus for their understanding of Zechariah and their faithfulness, show that this ministry began three and a half years before on the Day of Atonement. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. After the beginning of the 70th week, in the middle of it, as it turns out, Christ was cut off from the land of the living for the sins of the world and not because of any wrong he had done. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. When this happened, the people of the prince, or in other words, the church, took the city of God and the land of God and the kingdom of God from the nation. Jesus said to them that the kingdom was taken from them and given to a nation 
bringing forth the fruits of the kingdom. St. Peter said in 1 Peter 1 and verse 2 that this nation is the church and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Judgment is visited by God upon the nation as a result. This judgment lasts as long as the holy war in righteousness goes on in this world. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Christ came as the king of the Jews and was sent only to the nation of Israel. He said that on multiple occasions. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. By the sacrifice of himself, by the voiding of the covenant of the law, Jesus made all sacrifices and offerings by the Jews and in the temple null and void. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Because of the abomination of their rejection of the king and his kingdom, and the crucifixion and killing of the Lord of glory, their covenant was vacated, their house was left desolate, and the protection that God had given them before was withdrawn, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. From that day until this, and on until the end of the world, the Jews have been the most hated and persecuted of people. Now this is no justification or exoneration of any man or nation who has set forth his hand to take vengeance upon them. Vengeance belongs to the Lord, but it does belong to the Lord, and it is the Lord Jehovah, the God of the broken covenant, the God of Deuteronomy 28.53, who has determined this judgment upon them. For those of you who are skeptics about the orthodox interpretation of Daniel 9:24 to 27, it is interesting, is it not, that the earthly life and ministry of Christ fulfills all these predictions to a T. And in any case, it is a far cry from the undisciplined imagination, invention, guesswork, distortion, humanism, materialism, commercialization, and science fiction of the premillennial view. So where did we start and where do we end with Daniel 9.27? Jesus began to be about 30 years old, which means on his 30th birthday. Daniel 9.24-27 establishes that without any question in my mind to be the day of atonement. How important is this? Well, I think it's always important to be accurate in your interpretation, and there's a lot of meaning added to the life and earthly ministry of Christ when we realize that he started his ministry on the Day of Atonement and it ended three and a half years later at Passover. If you're still not convinced and you prefer your science fiction stories to the Bible, so be it. The Bible says, he that is ignorant let him be ignorant. Now next time, if the Lord is willing, we will take up a very interesting subject that you will not want to miss, that of the last half of Daniel's 70th week. Read more at GodsPointOfView.com. A copy of this book is available from Amazon in Kindle and paperback format. Link in the description.